After the fire, the area became almost inhabitable. It was so bad, the U.S. government gave each family $50 and free transport to anywhere they wanted in the country. Yet, despite all this, a few managed to hang on. Thus, the town was rebuilt. Hey sightseers, Sightseeing Sally here and... Marty. Today we're checking out... Peshtigo. And why are we checking out Peshtigo, Marty? Because of the news. Yes, because of the news. And we haven't did the town. That too. If you're wondering exactly what news Marty was referring to, that is the news of the wildfire that destroyed a Hawaiian village on the island of Maui. According to the news reports, that fire is the most devastating fire to happen in America's modern history. However, little do people know that America's most disastrous forest fire actually happened here in Peshtigo. That's right, America's deadliest and most disastrous wildfire occurred in Peshtigo on October 8th of 1871. And most people don't realize this because on the exact same night that the Peshtigo fire occurred, the Great Chicago Fire happened. And not only that, because the fire itself was so destructive and devastating, it wiped out communication with the outside world. So very few people were even able to find out about it right after it happened. Now, if some of this looks familiar to you sightseers, that's because years ago, Marty and I came out and did a video on the historical museum talking about specifically the Peshtigo fire. It occurred on October 8th, 1871. It's described as a fiery inferno. If you want to watch that video, I'll have the link available down below. But what we didn't do at that time was walk around the town and explore the sites of Peshtigo itself, which is what we're going to do today, along with share some of the history about the fire that occurred here. Considered America's forgotten disaster, the Peshtigo Fire of 1871 wiped out an area the size of Rhode Island and is the deadliest wildfire in modern American history. Described as a firestorm, more lives were lost to this blazing inferno than anywhere else, as we'll soon see. Starting with the cemetery that's here next to the Peshtigo Fire Museum. Here you'll find a mass grave where 350 unidentified men, women, and children lie in rest along with the previously shown historical marker that commemorates the lives of these fire victims. In addition, throughout the cemetery, you'll find plaques such as the one you see here, detailing some of the events that occurred on the night of the fire and their connection with the person who's buried there. According to this grave marker, Charles Lawrence, and his family perished in the October 8, 1871 fire after a large balloon-like object landed in their midst as they were huddled in a field. That object burst open and flames shot out, wiping out the entire family. The thing you need to know about the Peshtigo fire is that this was no ordinary wildfire. It was in fact a rare and strange phenomenon known as a fire nado. In other words, a tornado of fire. According to what I know of its local or nowadays or back then, they claim the meteorologists claim that wind speeds were as high as 100 miles an hour. Yes, that's exactly right. From what I read of various reputable sources, there was a very enormous low pressure cell that came through and if it had actually been raining they would have categorized it as a hurricane coming through this area. The winds in that low pressure cell most likely is what created 
the tornado-like situation that swept through. Survivors described it as a whirlwind, a tornado of flames descending on them so rapidly they had no time to act. Basically, you were moving on instinct. And initially, when people looked back on it, they thought perhaps it was the trauma of the event that created a sense of feeling of a tornado descending on them. But since then, they have studied what happened and actually discovered that what happened here was something rare and unusual, something you've not seen pretty much anywhere else in the world. And that is a real tornado of fire. Since we've already done the museum once before, we're just gonna move on. Otherwise, there wouldn't be enough time for us to show you the town of Peshtigo itself. And I know really for most of you, that's the part you're probably the most curious about what happened in the 152 years since the great fire. You know, how did the city revive itself? What's now here? You know, things of that nature. It's kind of funny. I don't think you could tell by looking at the street today that this used to be the location of the town's brothels, the saloons, and all kinds of mischief going on. In fact, what's here now is pretty bland in comparison. Why don't we take a quick look-see so you can see for yourself. Starting with the road excavating king, where you can hire somebody to dig your septic and mound systems. And then right next door, the Peshtigo pub, where you can get $1.50 tacos today. Oh goody, happy hours from four to six. Yay! I guess some things haven't changed all that much on the street. Continuing on, next door to the Peshtigo Pub, you have the Birth and Rosenthal Furniture and Carpeting Store, an unknown building with what appears to be a lovely looking little hammock swing, and the landmark building, which used to be a community-based residential facility that apparently is now condemned. Which is really unfortunate because the building appears to be the remains of perhaps an old mansion that was built here back in the day after the fire. It might be kind of hard to see because of all the overgrowth, but over here you can see this section of the porch is rounded, kind of curved, like you see on some of those really old houses. And then up there you can see what looks like an old cupola. Curious about the origins of the landmark, I decided to do some digging. I learned that the landmark was built by Dr. Antoine Barrette, who used the building as a facility for housing those who couldn't take care of themselves. Essentially, it was one of the earliest forms of an assisted living center. Interestingly enough, it was also connected to the local insane asylum. Now condemned, it sits empty. I think you already have an idea of what Peshtigo is like today, in that the town doesn't look any different than many of the other towns here in northeastern Wisconsin, and certainly doesn't appear to be the location of America's deadliest wildfire. Yet, it is. According to local estimates, the number of people who perished during the Peshtigo fire was somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 people, though some believe that number may be closer to 2,500. Given that just about everything in town, with the exception of a few artifacts that were somehow saved, all the historical records were burned up, not to mention few people have any idea as to the number of Native Americans who may have perished during the fire. And along with that, in some places, the fire was so hot 
that everything was literally reduced to ashes. It just makes it really difficult to put an exact number on the amount of lives lost here. To put this in perspective, everyone marveled at how intense the Chicago fire was because it jumped the river. Yet, in comparison, the Peshtigo fire was so intense that somehow it managed to jump the Bay of Green Bay, burning parts of Door County. As you can see, we're now standing in front of the Peshtigo Public Library. Open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 to 6. I was just going to go walk in there, and then I realized something. It's Tuesday. I know, classic rookie mistake. What can I say? I'm only human. For those of you interested in reading a first-hand account from a survivor of the Peshtigo Fire, check out the book, The Great Peshtigo Fire, an eyewitness account written by Reverend Peter Pernan. Moving on. Off in the distance, you can see the top of the old church that is now the historical museum. And then right here is a place called Mint Expressions. And then this block here, which we just checked out, and the library here. Mint Expressions! Did somebody say Mint Expressions? Why does it sound like, to me, the perfect place to get ice cream? Sadly, though, I think I'm out of luck. It's custom apparel printing, embroidery, signage, banners, and more. Maybe I'm not out of luck. Could always go in there and see about getting some merch made up for Sightseeing Sally. Anyways, before I get sidetracked onto something else, I just want to point out that there is a gas station there, Chris Food Mart, and then you've got the Big Woods Realty sign, Homes, Cabins, and Land which I'm assuming is for this place here, but don't quote me on that. Around the corner from the Big Woods Realty sign I just showed you is the Dejanet Financial Building. As you might have guessed from everything I've shown you thus far, the people who settled here and survived the fire had to be extremely resilient. Think about it. They just survived the most horrifying experience of their lives and then had to literally build their town out of the ashes. It's really amazing when you think about it, especially when you can see what the town is like today. So amazing that Marty and I might have to go celebrate after we're done making this video with some ice cream. One thing that sets Peshtigo apart from some of the other small towns we've visited is the lack of a historic district or historic downtown. You'll notice that many of the buildings on its main street appear to be a lot newer than most. Given its history though, I don't find that too unusual. Not surprisingly, the oldest building still standing in town is the old church that now houses the Peshtigo Fire Museum. Built after the fire in 1872, the church was moved here in 1927 after another church that previously stood here was struck by lightning and burnt down. Other historic buildings in town include the one that now houses Mint Expressions, the Peshtigo Cafe, and the Riverview Pub. Some of you sightseers might find this interesting. Where the Center Bowl is now used to stand a historic hotel known as the Charlotte. Yes, I know sightseers. It looks like it should be pronounced Cholette or Cholet. But I did confirm with one of the locals and everybody called it the Charlotte. Oh look, a thrift store. I'm surprised Marty hasn't found his way in there yet. Called Thrifty Treasures, they've got cool junk and a treasure box inside. You know, other than the few reminders like this, 
around town, you would have no clue that something as disastrous as that horrible fire happened here. That's how far Peshtigo has come since that fateful October day. Some might be wondering, could this disaster been prevented? It's difficult to say. Sometimes there's just no stopping the forces of nature. Another historic building still standing here in town is the one that now houses Peshtigo's food pantry. According to what I learned from one of the locals, this building here used to be the old Odd Fellows building. Later, it was converted into a dentist's office. And apparently upstairs, there used to be a dance hall that was later turned into a dojo for Taekwondo. Now, as you can see, it's used as the food pantry. A couple more old buildings, and then we're gonna move on. We're really close to the river, and that's where I wanna end up today. But before we go any further, I have a couple of quick shout outs to give. Special thanks goes out to Sue from Villa Park, Illinois for tipping our trip job. Yay! And then I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to all of you who've given us a super thanks here on YouTube. Because of your generosity and your willingness to help fill that gas tank, we're able to get out to all these awesome places here in Wisconsin and across America. Now, back to Peshtigo. In front of me, you can see another old building here in town. If I'm not mistaken, this is the former location of the Peshtigo newspaper. You can see from its cornerstone, it was likely built in 1936, and it has a really neat old neon sign just waiting to be restored. I think that old sign would look really cool hanging in Marty's man cave. Right, Marty? Oh, never mind. He didn't even hear me. Moving on. One of the older homes still standing here in Peshtigo You'll notice it's made of red brick. This house has the same kind of rounded edge on its front porch, just like the landmark does. Another historic site in town is the location of the former Thompson Boat Company. Founded in 1904 by the Thompson Brothers, this well-known boat company once made wooden boats here. Later, it became Sentinel Structures, a manufacturer of laminated beams. Now, according to one of the locals, the buildings sit empty. Look, a siren. Good thing it's attached to a building site, Sears. Yeah, come back at night with a hacksaw on it, won't be. If I could shoot daggers right now, I would. Some of the other old historic homes here in Peshtigo. I'm not surprised that these are close to the river. Speaking of the river, I wanted to end this video by showing you a few sites along the river, mainly because the river provided a source of refuge for some of those who survived the fire. In front of me is the hydropower dam. It was built in 1920 on the site of the original wooden mill dam. The wooden mill being one of the major industries that was here at the time of the fire. With all the forest land surrounding the town, it was only natural that Peshtigo was a boom town dominated by the lumber industry. In addition to being home to the world's largest woodenware factory, you had the sawmill on the river a foundry, and a sash door and blind factory. You can see that the city of Peshtigo has built a really nice viewing deck on which visitors can stand and watch various species of fish spawn in the river. Of course, you gotta come out at the right time if you wanna catch any of the action because fish don't just spawn any old day of the year. But I digress because at the time of the fire, spawning season would have been well over. 
What is noteworthy about the fish, however, is that after the fire, they discovered a number, a large number of fish that had perished from the heat of the fire. But what's interesting about that is that in the same token, many of the people who survived the fire were immersed in the same water that the fish had been. The question being then, how was that even possible? Especially when you take into account that at that time of the year, the water, the river water was cold. People actually suffered from hypothermia from being submerged in the water for so long. I don't know. I personally don't have an answer to that. I know from everything I've read and understand about the fire, it's one of those mysteries that nobody's been able to solve. That isn't the only unexplained thing to happen that night. Items that should have been incinerated somehow weren't. The white tabernacle from the Catholic Church was found unscathed near the riverbank where Father Pernan had carried it while everything around it was charred black. Somewhere out there is where Father Peter Pernan spent almost six hours of his life trying to survive the Peshtigo fire. Of course, Father Peter wasn't the only person from Peshtigo to take to the river. Many of the townsfolk attempted to escape the deadly flames by submersing themselves in the river, though not everyone who did survived. Some succumbed to hypothermia, while others drowned. Still others were so badly injured during the event that those who lived to see another day found themselves laying to rest, loved ones, days after the event. All said, though this is the most tragic wildfire in all of America's history, it is absolutely amazing that Peshtigo still exists today.